hello. I think we can get started now. <clears throat> you hear me all right? Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, my name is Dylan Fagan, and I am one of the co-organizers of the Spinoza Studies Working Group at UC Berkeley in this conference. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, just as in the morning panel, we will hear from the speakers for about 30 minutes, uh, and then we'll have a short break and can come back for a period of questioning and answering and discussing. Uh, please write any of your questions in the chat uh, when we return from the break, and Joseph and I can moderate the discussion. Um, I want to thank a few people who helped make this uh, conference possible. Um, Hannah Hart from UC Berkeley for making the conference posters and the Townsend Center at UC Berkeley for their support. Um, I also want to thank the Spinoza Studies Working Group of UC Berkeley, in particular, uh, Sean Matharu, Alexander Lin, uh, Jose Patino Romero, Najat Kadir, and Joseph Serrano. Um, we've met regularly for the last few years, first reading some of Spinoza's works, and for the past year, reading, rereading, and discussing Mushray's book. So thank you all for your initiative and concentration. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce the speakers on this panel. Um, they are Sierhe Biareshik, Mariana Gainza, and Warren Montag. Uh, Sierhe is visiting assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania in the Department of Germanic Languages and Literatures. Uh, his essay, Spinoza's Politics of Error, was published in the volume Spinoza's Authority, Volume 2, Resistance and Power in the Political Treatises, edited by Kirina Cordella and Dimitris Bartolakis on Bloomsbury in 2018. And Serhe's paper today is entitled Toward the Materialist Dialectic Before Hegel, Extimate Determination in Novalis. Mm -hmm. Mariana Gainza is a sociologist at the Universidad de Buenos Aires, and she is a teacher in the Faculty of Social Sciences. Her essay, Materialist Variations on Spinoza, Theoretical Alliances and Political Strategies was published in the volume Materialism and Politics with the Cultural Inquiry book series in Berlin in 2021. Mariana's paper today is entitled About Circles and Limits. Our first panelist today is Warren Montag. Warren is the Brown Family Professor of Literature at Occidental College. As many of you here already know, his contribution to our understanding of the thinking of Louis Althusser, amongst others, has generated important and often extraordinary effects in and on the conjuncture of philosophy and Marxism. He is currently working on a book on Spinoza. Warren's paper today is entitled Machere's Critique of the Critique of Any Possible Dialectic. Please help me in welcoming them all. Thank you. Warren, you can begin whenever you like. Okay, thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be here. The, I really enjoyed the first panel and I hope, uh, I, I assume, I know that the next pan this panel will be uh, just as interesting. Okay, at the time of its publication, Pierre Machere's Hegel or Spinoza, 1979, was widely seen as what one reader described as a detailed articulation of the heretofore unstated and perhaps originally absent theoretical foundation of the Althusserian project, a foundation that was necessary, but just as necessarily deferred to the end of that project, as if the concepts without which it could not have begun were fully realized only as its result. Above all, Machere's book, one of the last to appear in the Théorique uh, collection, but it was uh, edited by Althusser, appeared to have arrived precisely to provide a detailed explanation of the inescapable choice facing those who sought to develop Marx's discoveries in the light of the experimental results of a century of class struggle. And the, the choice was between Hegel or Spinoza. And indeed, Althusser's forceful critique of certain aspects of Hegel's philosophy, in particular those imported into Marx's work, both early and late, as notions that allowed him, within a specific theoretical conjuncture, to proceed with his, his investigation, even as they remained inadequate to his discoveries and in a different conjuncture would become obstacles to the development of Marx's theory. Despite this fact, 
over time, concepts taken from or more commonly inspired by Hegel, and that Marx, with the par partial exception of the 1844 manuscripts, used sparingly and with great caution, were increasingly absorbed into the various forms of official and unofficial Marxism. The most important of these were concepts unrecognized as such, existing in the form of unacknowledged assumptions whose validity was quote unquote obvious. And I'm speaking of uh, concepts such as contradiction, the whole, das ganze, or, or uh, sometimes totality, and the closely allied concept of teleology. Teleology in particular had played an important and disastrous role in both its right and left variants in the socialist and communist movements, but had done so without being acknowledged as such. Few Marxists explicitly invoked the notion of teleology, even when they spoke of the immutable stages of human history in its progress towards the realization of the final, truly rational form of social life. Teleology in turn uh, was explicit in its Hegelian form and then later implicitly closely tied to Hegel's notions of negation and the negation of the negation, which I'm going to talk about in a, in a little bit. <clears throat> One of Althusser's first experiments in, in identifying certain elements of Hegel's thought as theoretical obstacles to the development of Marxist theory, his 1962 essay, contradiction and overdetermination was by any measure a success and not simply because of the scandal that it caused. Althusser traced a line of demarcation between on the one hand, the Hegelian concept of contradiction in its ideal form as a, as a polarity that served to guarantee the progressive direction of history, even when progress was hidden behind one of the ruses necessary to the achievement of its end on the one side, and then on the other, a notion existing primarily in what Althusser called the practical state, that is a, the, of a contradiction composed of an accumulation of forces whose unity was based on nothing more than a concurrence of circumstances, a gathering of forces that led to the point at which the tension between the cracks and fault lines that divided them were sufficient to cause a fracture. And he, this is what he referred to as unité de rupture. Derived from Lenin's description of the configuration of irreducibly diverse circumstances that produced the Russian Revolution, Althusser's notion of overdetermined contradiction unquestionably succeeded in drawing a distinction between two con conceptions of contradiction one of which, which linked to a teleology of modes of production, he called Hegelian. Although in fact, he associated it with the not very Hegelian mechanistic fatalism of the second international. From a group of texts, the phenomenology of spirit, science of logic and the philosophy of history, Althusser extracted an internally consistent version of Hegelianism, that while denying the real complexity of Hegel's texts, was dressed up in a dazzling theoretical finery that made the final unmasking of Hegel's meaning all the more dramatic, and I'm quoting here. In a text as beautiful as the night, the phenomenology celebrates the labor of the negative in beings and works, the spirit's sojourn even in death, the universal trouble of negativity, dismembering the corpse of being to give birth to the glorious body of that infinity of nothingness becomes become being the spirit. And every philosopher trembles in his soul as if he was in the presence of the mysteries, unquote. That's from the, on the materialist dialectic. But while Althusser succeeded in separation, separating the notion of contradiction proper to the tendency within Marxism he identified as Hegelian from a notion of contradiction actually put to use in the practice of the class struggle, he also succeeded in producing an improbable Hegel, 
improbable because without contradiction or conflict. And this improbable Hegel quickly won the approval of Deleuze uh, and even uh, Derrida, who's typically very, very critical of Althusser, uh, who, and this is recorded in a conversation that uh, Althusser took notes on, and uh, his notes are in the, uh, the archive at uh, IMEC in, in, in uh, France. Um, and according to Althusser's notes, Derrida suspected that Althusser was still holding on to certain aspects of Hegelian philosophy, in particular, the concept of the dialectic that for Derrida at the end of the 60s, uh, condemned in all of its possible forms uh, as a reactive and apologetic uh, doctrine. Okay. Further, Althusser's attempt, attempts to attempt to remove the obstacle constituted by Hegel was accompanied by an exaltation of Spinoza, as if the latter were the antidote to Hegelianism. In Reading Capital, uh, 1965, Althusser wrote, quite famous, but it's worth looking at again, Spinoza's philosophy, this is Althusser, Spinoza's philosophy introduced an unprecedented theoretical revolution in the history of philosophy, probably the greatest philosophical revolution of all time, insofar as we can regard Spinoza as Marx's only direct ancestor from the philosophical standpoint. However, this radical revolution was the object of a massive historical repression and Spinoza's philosophy suffered much the same fate as Marx's philosophy used to and still does suffer in some countries. It served as damning evidence for a charge of atheism. The insistence of the 17th and 18th century establishments hounding of Spinoza's memory and the distance every writer had ineluctably to take with respect to Spinoza in order to obtain the right to speak, as in the case of Montesquieu, are evidence both of the repulsion and the extraordinary attraction of his thought. The history of philosophy's repressed Spinozism, thus unfolded as a subterranean history acting at other sites in political and religious ideology, deism, and in the sciences, but not on the illuminated stage of visible philosophy." End of quote. I, and I, I, I just want to note in passing that uh, it's, this is obviously extraordinary hyperbolic uh, statement on Althusser's part, but in particular, uh, the account of the, the burying of Spinoza, Spinoza's obscurity in relation to Marxism uh, is not exactly right in certain ways, but in particular, uh, I just I want to recognize the group of a, a fairly diverse uh, number of young uh, Soviet philosophers around the journal under the banner of Marxism in the 1920s, and much of their work remains untranslated or has only been translated very recently. Uh, Abram Deborin. Lyubov Axelrod and Israel Weinstein were all extremely perceptive readers of Spinoza who in certain ways tried to or attempted to apply Spinoza to Hegel as a way of making visible what was valid and invalid in the latter's conception of the dialectic. And I, I just uh, reading their work recently uh, in overseeing a translation of some of it, uh, I, I find it very, very, very interesting and uh, something that most people don't know anything about. Okay, um, well, I'll just say a description of Spinoza as leading the greatest revolution ever seen in the history of philosophy, left in suspense the nature and objectives of this revolution. He remarked almost in passing in the introduction to Reading Capital that Spinoza was, quote, the first man ever to oppose the problem of reading and in consequence of writing, unquote. For most of Althusser's readers, this specification was only slightly less enigmatic than the reference to Spinoza's philosophical revolution. Those who went on to read Machere's uh, Théorie de la Production Littéraire, a book written at Althusser's suggestion, whose primary concern was to establish 
the materiality of writing uh, and to derive from this analysis of the different forms of, uh, uh, of literature, learned that Althusser was referring to chapter seven of Spinoza's Tractatus Theological Politicus, the chapter entitled On the Interpretation of Scripture. Machere noted that Spinoza's protocol for reading the Bible opened a series of questions about the nature of texts, about whether they contain hidden meanings below the surface, as well as questions concerning the norms we impose on texts, namely consistency, coherence, and completeness. Rather than attempt to reconcile the diverse, divergent, and yes, contradictory teachings displayed in scripture by twisting the letter of the text, Spinoza argued that we should regard these differences not as faults or imperfections, but is, as the effects of the history that is simultaneously inside and outside the texts. In the case of philosophical texts, the idea that the goal of scholars is to discover errors of reasoning and faulty arguments in order to replace them with better arguments gives way to the notion that an adequate knowledge of philosophical texts derives from an explanation of the contradictions that animate every philosophical work. This manifestly Hegelian thesis not only allowed Althusser, Machere, and Balibar to identify the recourse to Hegelian concepts, especially the concept of historical time, that remained irreducibly antagonistic to the problematic opened by Marx, it also gave rise to the principle that both demanded and made possible a detailed account of the conflicts proper to any given philosophy, including that of Hegel himself. It was precisely this approach that allowed Althusser to begin to identify the elements in Hegel's philosophy that appeared in the light of a new conjuncture to break free from the totality that Hegel insisted his philosophy constituted. His lectures on the history of philosophy, which began with the non-philosophy that philosophy had to negate in order to become itself, the Eastern or Oriental, the Chinese, Indian, Muslim and Jewish doctrines that passed for philosophy, but which were in their essence anti-philosophies, which threatened to reduce all thought to what Hegel uh, in a very picturesque way uh, says is the empty uniformity of the deserts and plains these cultures inhabited. And he opposes that, it's kind of funny, to the forests of uh, Central Europe, uh, which have some kind of privilege for him. Spinoza thus represented a return of the repressed, or more properly, the undoing of the sublation of non-philosophy within philosophy itself for Hegel. And Hegel uses the term uh, or the phrase uh, Nachklang des Morgenlandes, which is often translated as uh, Spinoza is the echo of Eastern lands. But Nachklang, uh, which does mean echo, can also refer to something that lingers, something that has outlived its time, while Morgenlandes, conventionally understood as Eastern lands or the Orient, literally means morning lands, referring to the fact that the sun rises in the East. The choice of this word instead of Orient, which Hegel uses elsewhere, reminds us that Spinoza's philosophy has lingered on for him, a remnant of earlier times, a remnant of the dawn of philosophy, and it constitutes that which has refused to disappear on time and has survived by disguising itself as something modern. Spinoza speaks the language of Cartesianism, according to Descartes, but only the better to conceal what unites him with the doctrines of the Eleatics, the Hebrews, the Arabs, and the Hindus the idea of the undifferentiated one into which all individual and particular existences must disappear. For Hegel, Spinoza's substance is negation or rather negativity that is itself never negated and that is best understood not as the source of being but as the abyss of being. However indefensible Hegel's account of Spinoza's substance may be, 
it is not by that fact without significance. It tells us that for Hegel, Spinoza represents uh, an abyss in Hegel's own philosophical project, whose completion is tied, as he writes in the conclusion uh, to the lectures of the history of philosophy, to the accomplishment that is the completion of philosophy itself. Spinoza threatens to linger beyond the end of philosophy, beyond the end, as if he were the lone survivor of the negation of the negation. From Machere's position then, it is not possible to oppose a materialist Spinoza to an idealist Hegel, an operation that would necessarily involve suppressing the contradictions, discrepancies, and the prune proper to both philosophers. In Hegel's case, we would be confronted with an improbable Hegel who had somehow freed himself from the contradictory development that he repeatedly argued made the history of philosophy intelligible. Instead, Machre, by taking as his object Hegel's critique of Spinoza, shows us the impasses to which Hegel's thought sometimes leads him, but also the moments that are very fruitful, but at which he abandons a path he has painstakingly cleared because he discovers that it leads to Spinoza. In order to attribute to Spinoza ideas above all concerning substance, attributes, and modes that are incompatible with any statement found in uh, part one of the ethics, Hegel is compelled to find them elsewhere or to fabricate them himself. But Machere is not interested in, in correcting Hegel's inaccurate reading of the ethics. The hypothesis that guides his analysis is that the points at which Hegel is most critical of Spinoza are not only those where his account of Spinoza's actual arguments is strikingly contrary to what Spinoza says. More importantly, these are the points at which Hegel's own trajectory threatens to converge with Spinoza's. Spinoza, in contrast to Hegel, uh, is content not only to leave traces of his sometimes abrupt inter interruptions of a particular line of thought. And these are things that Hegel uh, scrupulously covers up to make his uh, doctrine appear coherent. But Spinoza marks them as, marks them as interruptions with variants of the phrase sed dihis satis, which means, but enough about this sometimes promising to return to the topic later, a promise he does not always uh, fulfill and sometimes just leaving it uh, at that. But even more striking is the fact that Spinoza left works to which he had devoted considerable effort unfinished from the admittedly early treatise on the emendation of the intellect to the Hebrew grammar. But it is above all the Tractatus Politicus which ends with the sentence said to his satis, and then it's followed by a posthumously added editorial note, we're all familiar with this, reliqua desiderantur, that dramatizes his refusal to conceal the obstacles that have arisen from his own writing to bar the way to the movement of his thought, as if in some way he were flaunting this incompleteness as a sign of his own, what Althusser called theoretical prudence. Referring to Althusser's remarks uh, in the elements of self-criticism on the, what he called the paradox of Spinoza's repetition through anticipation of key elements of Hegel's philosophy, uh, Machere insists on a rapprochement, rapprochement between them that is not limited to resemblance or similitude. It is as if they, or perhaps parts of their thought, form a singular composite individual defined as such, following Spinoza's remarks in definition 10 of part two of the ethics, by its capacity to produce effect. But this rapprochement is not based solely on the principle of, uh, of convenientia, that is agreement or harmony, or if it is, this harmony or agreement is the effect of the constraint imposed by a specific balance of opposing forces. It might be possible to describe this singular thing, 
formed by the Hegel-Spinoza relation as constituted by a multiplicity of forces arrayed in the form of an overdetermined contradiction defined by the unevenness proper to it. There is no questioning that, uh, as Althusser and Mashre have noted, Hegel shares or participates in the philosophy of imminence that marks Spinoza's work, the rejection of transcendence, a, re a recognition of the imminence of right and power and a defense of knowledge against the demand that its validity be determined by procedures of certification and that it be not simply true or in the true, but certain. But the points of contact between Hegel and Spinoza are the points from which Hegel, precisely on the basis of the commonality that envelops them, launches his attacks on Spinoza, particularly in the lectures on the history of philosophy. According to him, Spinozism is a variant of Cartesianism by virtue of its dualism, which is a, you know, a stunning thing to hear about Spinoza. According to Hegel, despite what Spinoza says, there are only two attributes of the one substance, thought and extension. Moreover, the attributes are emanations that is degraded expressions of the one that precedes all particularities and therefore lack the reality that it alone possesses. It's a Neoplatonic uh, idea. It is interesting to note that in uh, Hegel's, what, what is one of the longest accounts of a particular philosopher in Hegel's lectures, the word imminence whether as a noun or as, as the adjective imminent, appears only once in the entire account of Spinoza. And it's um, uh, where Hegel cites ethics uh, part one, proposition 18, and he cites the entire proposition. God is the imminent, not transitive cause of all things. That's it but only because he's going to tell us that this, is, that this isn't at all what, what uh, Spinoza means, that for Spinoza, there is no cause uh, in substance or perhaps anything else. Substance is a perpetual squandering of itself in its attributes and modes. Its creations are not teleological in nature, in nature produced to fulfill a purpose by a free subject or person who decides or determines the end uh, which a thing is designed to fulfill, but are rather merely mechanical, part of a natural process that does not involve any free subjectivity. Hegel advances an extraordinary phrase to capture the fundamental problem with Spinoza's conception of substance as urgrund, but does so not in the chapter on Spinoza, but in his discussion of Locke a few chapters later. And thus it's no accident that few scholars have uh, referred to this phrase uh, because in, whether by design or default, it is in some objective sense hidden. And I'm going to read the German because it's a, it's a very weird uh, uh, statement in a certain way. Okay. And then I'll, I'll give a translation. Uh, Spinoza hat dem negativen Unrecht getan. Es kam der hier zu keiner immanenten Bestimmung. Alles Bestimmte geht zu Grunde. Okay. So, literally, which makes it kind of funny, it, it could read something like Spinoza has wronged the negative. But of course, we would translate it as Spinoza has erred concerning the negative. And, and Hegel goes on, there was thus no imminent determination or cause because everything determined perishes. That's the end. Okay. Mashre, fully aware of the discrepancy between Hegel's peremptory dismissal of Spinoza's notion of imminent causality, which Hegel insisted was nothing more than a cover for the most impoverished possible notion of negation, negation as irreversible loss, as substance incapable of serving as the urgrunde of implacable progress towards the absolute, noted that the basis for Hegel's argument is a single phrase, thanks in part, now it's quite famous, thanks in part to Hegel, understood as central to the argumentation underlying the ethics. 
omnis determinatio est negatio. All determination is negation. Mashre reminds us that this line does not occur in the ethics, okay? And it is found only in letter 50 of his correspondence uh, to Yari Gieras. And it, it, Hegel has uh, taken it out of context and given it a universal meaning that it doesn't have even in the letter. Okay. In fact, uh, to quote Mashre here, the use he, Hegel, makes of it has precisely the precondition that he has taken it out of its context and that he takes it absolutely as an almost magical formula within, uh, within which the entire framework of Spinozism with its contradictions, its promises and its failures can be found as a kind of summary. Mashre, despite this characterization, as I noted before, renounces any attempt to emphasize its fictitious character in order to dismiss it. Again, we must know what logic leads Hegel to attribute this phrase to Spinoza to make it the principal marker and motif of their divergence. This statement must instead be understood as real, and this is Mashre, quote, functioning to a certain extent between Spinoza and Hegel and in which the contradiction between their two philosophies take its, uh, takes its visible form. Do, do I still have time to go on a little bit? Okay. To begin, uh, the statement all, determin all determination negation above all in the form Hegel gives to it might have been the beginning of a rapprochement between the two. Is it not a recognition of the power of the negative? In particular, the power of the negative set in motion, uh, the notion of substance that Hegel has repeatedly described as immobile and inert, which he sees as a, a fatal problem in Spinoza? Is it not finally the first step in a journey that necessarily concludes in the negation of the negation, the loss and recovery of being or the return of being to itself that confers upon it its concreteness? Further, if determination is negation, substance as the absolute that precedes determination and is therefore itself indeterminate can only be understood as having a positive existence that is denied to all that emanates from it uh, from the moment of its exteriorization. But Hegel refuses even this possibility, seeing in the principle of substance as causa sui, not the self-production of substance, but the principle of its self-elimination. Okay, and here I'm reading a, a quote from Hegel. In a similar manner, in the oriental conception of emanation, the absolute is the light which illumines itself. Only it not only illumines itself, but also emanates. Its emanations are distancings from its undimmed clarity. The successive productions are less perfect than the preceding ones from which they arise. The process of emanation is taken only as a, as a happening, the becoming only as a progressive loss. Thus being, incre thus being increasingly obscures itself and night the negative is the final term of the series, which does not first return into the primal light. The end of Hegel's uh, passage. The fact that Hegel never considers the possibility of understanding the absolute as having a positive existence that is negated and can be negated again in the movement by which the absolute returns to itself, despite such the advantages that such a reading offers from the perspective of his own philosophy, uh, is rather striking. He might, for example, have converted Spinoza into the adumbration of himself, according to a typological reading familiar to all Christians, like that according to which Moses is the type, the foreshadowing of Paul. Instead, Hegel's reading constitutes an admission that Spinoza is the exception to the necessarily linear and successive time of history, including the history of philosophy, a lingering on of both the East and of the Jew, of that which belongs to the past, but continues to wander through time with utter disregard 
for distinctions and boundaries. Instead of claiming Spinoza as the imperfect configuration, sorry, prefiguration of himself, whose errors Hegel has arrived to correct, and despite placing him between Descartes and Malebranche, Hegel's account of Spinoza makes it impossible, finally, to locate him as belonging either to East or West, ancients or moderns, atheist or mystic. Spinoza's philosophy is the, uh, the expression of a nothingness from which nothing can come. Uh, and I'm, I'm alluding to the beginning of the science of logic. At this point, having heard Hegel's argument that the failure of Spinoza's philosophy derives from his rejection of a concept that had yet to be identified, but which was necessary to the coherence of the system, uh, that is the negation of the negation, uh, if I do, I have time to briefly go into it or no? I can stop if you want. Five minutes? Okay. Um, uh, okay, I, I want to look at, at the negation of negation quickly. As Mashre notes, if the negation of the negation is familiar, its familiarity is due to a great extent uh, to its association with the famous triad that always uh, serves as a summary of Hegel's philosophy thesis. Uh, antithesis, uh, synthesis, it's a, they're different versions, but something like that. But in any of these versions, what does negate mean? What does it mean to negate from the point of view of Hegel? It certainly does not mean to destroy or obliterate what exists, but neither does it mean simply to subjugate or master it. And, and re referring to Aufhebung doesn't uh, help us that much either. In a sense, the meaning of negation emerges only in the negation of the negation. When what has been freed and then appropriated by the first negation is returned to the first positive moment, which is now more than it was before. Okay, and then finally, uh, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but uh, I, I wanted to just ask the question if whether, uh, it's conceivable uh, to have a dialectic that isn't based on teleology and on the negation of the negation, uh, that doesn't simplify, reconcile, and bring into harmony uh, the conflicts of history, which was the charge uh, leveled at Hegel. And uh, Machere's answer to that is yes, okay? And so reading Hegel and reading Hegel in the light of Spinoza poses the question of a dialectic. And, and uh, uh, there's a feeling that something like a dialectic remains necessary. The dialectic has as its sort of central concern, the irreducibility of conflict in a way that uh, few other ways of thinking uh, have. So uh, I'll just stop there and uh, get the gist of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mariana, you can uh, begin whenever you'd like. Thank you very much, Dylan, um, and Joseph and Necha for the organization and, and for your kind invitation. It is a great pleasure to be here. So I'm going to read and I'm beginning now. An ordinary way of reading Spinoza asserts, starting from God, Spinoza arrives to God. Marilena Chawi identifies this circular reading with a traditional interpretation of Spinoza, which inspired by a center pantheistic conception, installs the idea of a compact monolithic self-centered divine reality, ignoring the internal movement of Spinozian geometrical logic that proceeds from the absolutely infinite to the finite modes. Besides that circular reading, I would like to remember here that the very image of the circle itself has been associated with Spinoza the circle as a metaphor of a timeless being and an eternal knowledge. It was Hegel who used that association to celebrate Spinoza's conception of infinite 
when he interpreted the famous geometrical illustration of letter 12 in the terms of that connection between true infinite and circularity. And it was uh, Alexander Kochet who consecrated this circular interpretation of a Spinozism. To illustrate the Spinozist system, he uses the figure of a circle as the image of a total knowledge closed on itself and completed expression of the eternal existence of truth. It is clear that Hegel's praise of a Spinozian concept of infinite lies at the basis of this Kojebian association between Spinozism and circularity. If we recall the terms of Hegel's celebration of Spinoza's conception of infinite, the connection is explicit. The infinite is not an indeterminate multiplicity, Hegel says, but must be understood in a positive way as a circle that encloses within itself a perfect infinity. So the image of a circular infinite is immediately linked to the idea of a finished perfection, positively set, actually present. The main ambiguity of this Hegelian reading of Spinoza lies in the way of understanding the crucial problem of determination, which is one of the central points of Mascheret's reading of the encounter and descent between Hegel and Spinoza. Following Mascheret's approach, I will consider this misreading using the Spinozian example of the two non-concentric circles to thematize the singular Spinozian conception of determination and limits. Hegel says, Spinoza employs a mathematical example to illustrate the true infinite. Hegel refers to the well-known geometrical example where Spinoza, seeking to give force to his argument concerning the inadequacy of number for determination of things, make use of a mathematical case. It is for its own nature that the intervening space between two non-concentrical circles of different diameters, although being a limited space, is not numerically determinable since the inequalities of distance between the two circles and all the variations which matter in motion in the intervening space suffer surpass any numerical expression. In Hegel's presentation of the case appears the first and fundamental displacement of interpretation. The example, Hegel says, serves Spinoza to illustrate his concept of infinite. But in fact, Spinoza uses the example to demonstrate that number is inadequate to conceive the determination of a limited space that is a finite space. So the first important precision to be introduced is Spinoza does not use circles to think the true infinite, that is the thing which is infinite by virtue of its own nature. On the contrary, it is the reality of the finite most that is at issue in the example. In other words, the subject is not the substantial whole as the infinite, an infinite reality, but the parts of that whole as finite and limited things. Hegel substitutes the part for the whole. Secondly, what Spinoza mentions as an infinity of inequalities of distance, which cannot be expressed but any number, are transformed in the Hegelian reading into unequal distances that cannot be numbered because they constitute an infinite series. 
Hegel here inverts the noun and the adjective. He transfigures inequalities of distance into unequal distances. And if for a quick consideration, this might appear to be a simple nuance in the enunciation, completely modifies the sense of the example, which must allow us to conceive the parts of the part, that is, the constituents of that finite and limited reality, which is illustrated by the space between the two non-concentric non -concentric circles. The Hegelian unequal distances are identified with the infinite unequal segments that can be traced between the two circles, while by contrast, the Spinozian inequalities of distance are the differences between those infinite and equal segments. In the first case, the parts identified with the segments can be positively pointed to a discrete, to, to as discrete parts. In the second case, each part is a difference between two segments the difference between the distances that each of these segments positively points to. Thirdly, for, from this way of understanding the parts of this finite space as differences between unequal distances, derives the fact that each of them must be conceived as a passage. Thus, the dynamic character of this joint existence of the infinite parts of that circumscript reality explains why Spinoza refers to the variation of the movement of matter circulating through that space. That is why the inequalities of the space between the non-concentric circles constitute the non-numerable ensemble of differences between their unequal distances or the endless variation constituted by an infinity passages or transitions. Which is the Hegelian twist in this case? The movement of matter simply disappears from his consideration. Hegel omits the Spinozian allusion to matter and movement. Because he does not consider the key points of, his, of, of the example, mm. Hegel can then emphasize the completeness or actual perfection in the present that any figure immediately exhibits in its design. A delimited space which admits infinite strokes that can be delineated with uh, within it, while respecting the laws of its constitution, is characteristic of all kinds of geometrical form. This is why Hegel can homologate the actual infinite with a limited line containing an, an infinity of points. And also because he does not consider the key points of the example, Hegel can ignore the perpetual variation inside the limits of a finite thing, which is precisely what interests Spinoza. So what Hegel disconsidered is the very part particularity of Spinoza, Spinozian example, the singularity of the case, the fact that the non-concentricity of the circles requires conceiving what happens between that maximum and that, and that minimum in terms of movement. The fact that the parts that constitute that the limited interiority are not discrete parts, but differential parts. The fact that there is another notion of limit in play, which is not the fixed circumscription of a space, the maximum and the minimum are themselves differential parts relation between unequal distances. What is crucial here is that the notion of limit that appears in the example of letter 12 
is not the same as the one of another famous letter, which Hegel helped to popularize too, letter 50. Who says that he perceives a figure, he indicates that he conceives a determinate thing. This determination, therefore, does not appertain to the thing according to its being, but on the contrary, to its non-being, as the figure is nothing else than determination, and determination is negation. The figure can be nothing but negation. So the figure is not something positive, but the non-being of the thing it delimits. Thanks to the figure, the, de the determination of a content is realized, but from the perspective of an external other that circumscribes it by placing a spatial limit on it. Determination is negation in this precise sense, and determination as negation constitutes a limit associated with our perception of finite bodies. In contrast, the geometrical example of letter 12 allows us to face the other side of determination as affirmation, which leads us to consider the thing according to its being. And if letter 12 incites us to conceive determination in a different way, this is because what Spinoza considers differently there is the notion of limit. Determination as negation constitutes the idea of limit, not only as an external determination, but also as a being of reason, that is a non-being. But if this were the only notion of limit in Spinoza, it could be licit to say, as Hegel does, that finite things in Spinozian philosophy have no reality at all. The only reality for Spinoza would be the absolutely infinite substance, all determination being nothing but something imaginary and subjective that dissolves as soon as we place ourselves in the true perspective of God. But as we are saying, the case of the two non-concentric circles is presenting another conception of limit, which, which restores its reality and relates it with the positive consistency and the rela relational being of the finite things. If we were to identify in the example, the limit as negation as described in letter 50, we would say that the two circumferences are the non-being of the intervening space, both in the sense that beyond them, it ceases to be that space. And in the sense that it itself, as it is, this space, according to its being, it is not a circumference. What is then that intervening space between the two circumferences? It is a defined space, as Althusser says in another context, limited within itself by carrying the finitude of its definition which by excluding what it is not, makes it what it is. The non-concentricity of the circles is what defines in a certain and determined way the singular constitution of that spatial, spatial content, different from others with a maximum and a minimum that belongs to it as they constitute the content, that content sharing the same nature as the rest of these components. For this reason, they are imbricated with the other differential relations that compose that space. And also for this reason, the limit is not separable from the body of the thing. It is internal 
the matter that moves inside the intervening space increases to the maximum and decreases to the minimum its velocity when it crosses the limits parts in which the differential distance is the least or the greatest. But after increasing to the maximum and decreasing to the minimum, the movement continues inside the same space. The mobile matter, the concrete interiority of this space is then defined by the variable proportion of motion and rest, which is its existence. We know that for Spinoza, duration explains the existence of finite things according to their internal nature as an indefinite continuation of existing. That fluid existence made of infinite transitions or passages does not admit to be divided into autonomous parts or instants. So the existence of a finite things coincides with the essence of the same thing. The essence is defined as an effort which does not involve a finite time, but an indefinite one to persevere in, in existence. Existence is the continuous duration that results from, from or, or coincides with the affirmation of that essence as an effort of perseverance. Thus, the geometrical example illustrates the way in which the existence of a finite and limited thing coincides with the actual being of an essence that is the variable but continues striving to keep on lasting, that is excite, existing. And in this sense, letter 12 serves us, that is my point, to refer to the positive ontological determination of finite things as singular durations. At the beginning, I mentioned Kochev. So let us remember what he says. The Spinozian circle for him is the exact reverse of the circularity of, of absolute knowledge. So Spinoza is the only philosopher to share in an inverted way Hegel's position towards the concept. Absolute Spinozian error is as circular as absolute Hegelian truth. The fundamental problem now has to do with the concept of time. The conception of a unique and eternal substance not only excludes diversity, movement, and transformation, but also supposes the impossibility of speaking of being. Because discourse takes place in time, and more, it is time. As the only discourse that, is, that Spinozism admits is the pure affirmation of God, its counterpart is the disappearance of the world, finite things, and human beings. Knowledge about the unique being, the eternal concept, has to be a pure silence. The silence of man is the reverse of the monologue of God that occupies all the spaces of eternity as a complete emptiness of time. And the identification with this divine voice constitutes the alienated discourse of a science that claims to know eternity. That is why Spinoza's position is finally madness. To take Spinoza seriously is to be or to go crazy. And that is why Hegelian truth inverts Spinozian error. As far as Spinoza pretends to, to make an exhaustive presentation of being through a discourse that by suppressing time eliminates its own condition of possibility, Hegel's whole effort 
would consist in creating a Spinozist system that could be written by a man living in an historical world. An absolute knowledge, yes, but temporal and historical. Considering this objection and returning to my argument, I, I would ask, is the Spinozist realism of duration a way of suppressing time as an empty illusion? Certainly it is not. As we read in letter 12 itself, time serves to measure duration, introducing arbitrary separations and discontinuities in its flow. The, temporal, the temporally quantified duration is then an abstract duration, which is divided into discrete parts, which are its moments according to a certain referential measure. Therefore, we can say abstract time considered as a measure must correspond to the discontinuous series of segments located by Hegel in the geometrical example. But is the abstract time the only one that Spinoza philosophy allows us to think about? Time, Spinoza says, is a mode of imagination associated with the way in which the movement and rest of things are perceived by a being that is conscious of its own states to pay attention to the imaginary perspective of a finite, finite determination, it is useful to think in the little worm from letter 32 to Oldenburg. Let us imagine a little worm living in the blood, able to distinguish by sight the particles of blood, lymph, etc and to reflect on the manner on which each particle meeting with another particle is repulsed or communicates a portion of its own motion. So we can say this little worm is a being capable to imagine time. Its perceptions are stabilized and it is able to adopt certain habits while it identified the successive and regular apparition of three particles, the hour of apparition of particle EA, followed by the hour of particle B and the hour of particle C, a sequence that will determine, determine that the moment of apparition of B implies the association, the association of A with the image of a past time and the expectation of the apparition of C at a future time. This imaginary organization of duration is necessary for the life of human beings, those particular modes whose essence is called desired and live, as Spinoza says, in a part of the universe in the same way as the little worm lived in the blue. Finally, like the little worm navigating in the middle of the intervening space between non-concentric circles, we come to understand what Spinoza says to Hegel. Insofar as true infinite cannot be, can, cannot be imagined, but only conceived, only a limited and finite thing can be represented by a figure. However, the boundaries of this figure do not exhaust its meaning. Determination is not only negation. What is affirmed has the form of an enigma to be um, deciphered. As it happens with the example of letter 12, a singular case captures us because of its enigmatic nature. When we look at, uh, at it for the first time, we do not understand it, but we are taken by that enigma. We know that there is something important going on there, 
we go round and around, we revolve around that circle. We orientate ourselves like Hegel by our imagination. We read it as he did. We read wrong and we read right, perceiving the, con the contours of the problem. Something relative to the infinite is at stake there. Something relative to the effort of understanding, to the reality and the experience of the limit. The example of the two circles is a place of condensation where the essential has to do with the decentering. The circles are not concentric. Hence the movement, the differential speeds, the rhythm, the fluidity, the disarrangement and articulation of time and duration. At some point, at some point, we know that we know. In that displacement between imagination and intu intuition, between Hegel and Spinoza, thanks to Machere, we grasp the form of that singular problematic case. We see it and we feel that we understand it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Sergei, well, whenever you'd like to start. I'm posting in the chat uh, some quotes I uh, use <clears throat> in the talk in case you're curious, but by no means you have to look at it. Thank you the organ uh, for the organizers uh, and the great presentations uh, so far. So at the outset of his book, Mascheret poses the problem of the possibility of the materialist uh, dialectic. To this end, Mascheret sees it necessary to eradicate the concept of contradiction, or more precisely, contradiction in essence inextricable from teleology, where substance becomes subject. The notion of contradiction in essence has plagued the philosophical tradition with dramatic political consequences from Hegel, Engels, Plichanov, Lenin, and beyond. Uh, so Mascheret seeks to forge an alternative tradition, I think, starting with Spinoza. The desire to reconstruct such a tradition is evident in Mascheret's attempt to put into dialogue Spinoza's idea of canatus as tendential opposition, alongside Kant's notion of real opposition as an alternative to the idealist dialectic, hoping to find in Kant a successor to Spinoza's thought. Ultimately, Kant's idea proves insufficient for these purposes. I would like to suggest that another thinker <clears throat> around 1800, a German romanticist philosopher and poet Novalis, offers an alternative to thinking contradiction in essence after Spinoza and before Hegel. To demonstrate this, I will show that Novalis embraces Spinoza's conception of, uh, of substance while departing from both Kant and the earlier variation of idealist dialectic in Schelling. In turn, I will argue that what I propose to call extimate determination in Novalis offers a specific interpretation of Spinoza's canatus that would enable thinking a materialist dialectic, an interpretation both opened up and simultaneously foreclosed in Machere's Machere reading of singular essences. <clears throat> As Machere ex explicates, Kant contrasts logical contradiction to real opposition. Whereas the logical contradiction concerns affirming or denying conflicting predicates within the same subject, the real opposition concerns the predicates that are positively determined outside their antagonism. That is, real opposition designates exterior relation given an experience. Kant resorts to the principle of real opposition in his explication of construction of matter. The concept of matter entails two opposing primitive or elementary forces, that of repulsion and attraction, by convention positive and negative, respect, uh, respectively. Well, the force of repulsion is immediately accessible to intuition, for example, when the body encounters resistance, the force of attraction is produced syllogistically, because without positing it, we would have to admit the absolute dispersal of matter. As such, the primitive forces manifest themselves only in their respective encounters as two exteriorities, while their conflict remains irreducible. 
It is this precondition that makes matter representable for knowledge. This means, in other words, that the real in the idea of real opposition does not at all speak to any affirmatively given reality because the opposition of forces can be affirmed only metaphysically. That is the limit set by, set by Kantian critique. <clears throat> As Machere points out, Hegel credits Kant's conception of matter with, quote, rousing the concept of a philosophy of nature from its slumber. The very limit of Kant's critique is, in Hegel's eyes, a shortcoming since it gives us no knowledge of matter as such. Hegel's solution is to inject the dialectic in the conception of matter. In contrast to opposition, in contradiction, contraries are united with each other in the same imminent process. In injecting the contradiction in the very essence of matter, the dynamism is posited in perpetuity. Before Hegel, Schelling's natural philosophy, evidently already roused by Kant from its slumber, embraces the conception of matter as the dualism of forces and extends this conception to nature as a whole, thereby also transgressing Kant's critical limit along similar lines to Hegel. In his text, Von der Welt on the World Soul, a principle of general dualism of nature manifests itself in polarization of forces in all natural phenomena. So, for example, positive, negative currents, uh, uh, charges of electric current. Hmm? The principle which he terms the world soul. You can look at uh, a quote number one for this. To justify his claim methodologically, Schelling draws on Spinoza's schema of substance, attributes, and modes. Schelling posits his two forces as the two attributes of substance. The conflict of these forces necessarily constitutes each mode in its particular participation in substance. Without going into detail uh, of Schelling's fraud uh, adaptation of Spinoza, it is important to note that the two forces which he equates with attributes of substance do not comprise an exterior opposition, but are imminent to all bodies in nature. It is therefore not difficult to recognize an early variation of Hegelian idealist dialectic. And you can look at uh, quote number two for this. Real opposition and, and Gegensetzung, not Kantian Gegensatz, and Gegensetzung, here, Schelling argues, is possible between magnitudes of the same kind. The emergence of particular things in nature is the result of this dynamic. What for Hegel becomes the concept of contradiction in essence manifests itself in Schelling as the only proper account of retaining the dualism of forces in the conception of the kind of causality pertaining to living organisms, which is of course prohibited by Kant uh, as well, and nature or substance as an organism itself. Setting two attributes into a productive conflict, Schelling appears to find a way of injecting life into Spinoza's supposedly immobile substance in a similar manner that Hegel too enlivens. Positing the ontological polarization of forces, Schelling is forced to address the following question. Due to what is the conflict of such forces sustained? So what is the second order principle? So this is quote number three, I quote Schelling. Nature, without a doubt, would end up in a general neutralization if the perpetual impact of foreign principles did not abstract its own work. It thus sustains itself in eternal cycle, Kreislauf. In this quote, Schelling seems to imply that nature does not preserve itself through itself, but through itself and through the continuous impact of foreign principles. Schelling exhibits great vacillation uh, in grounding these foreign principles from posing an exceptional mode, uh, such as the sun, to maintaining some kind of a hierarchy of beings in nature. Though all these exceptions belong to nature in order to retain both dualism of forces and their homogeneity in essence of particular things, Schelling posits that nature abstracts its own work. Negativity becomes imminent. To nature. In other words, the attempt to retain the dialectic in essence comes at the cost of admission of self-limitation of nature. Novalis launches a critique of Schelling precisely on the points where the latter departs from Spinoza, without, however, returning to the Kantian metaphysics of exteriority of forces. In short, though not reading Spinoza, Novalis embraces Spinoza's conception of substance 
substance as power of self-actualization in order to propose an alternative to thinking of variety in nature to both Schelling and Kant, and thus to Hegel before Hegel. Novalis responds to Schelling in the following way, and this is uh, quote number four. Nature is eternal, not the converse. It sustains itself by itself. To that which, is, which it is once occasioned, it invariably develops according to the laws of inertia. One should look for the root of transience in the intellect. Perpetuum mobilium. In this remarkably condensed note, at first glance, eternity is juxtaposed to the discussion of transience in the subsequent sentence. But to imply that nature is transient and to impute this view to Schelling would be absurd. Rather, conversely, must refer to the relation of identity as opposed to predication between nature and eternity. That is, Novalis implies that eternity is not a property, predicate, or characteristic of nature. Eternity is nature. It is immanent to nature, just like the process of production of modes is immanent to the conception of nature as the immanent cause of Spinoza's natura naturans. Novalis's next statement further raises the stakes. Whatever nature is occasioned to do, it fulfills necessarily. Novalis's objection to Schelling goes to remind one of the fundamental characteristic in Spinozan conception of substance as affirmation, which rejects the negativity of the idealist dialectic at the outset. As Spinoza unequivocally states, quote, uh, Proposition 17 of Part 1 of the Ethics, God acts solely from the laws of its own nature, constrained by none. For only if nature, nature is consonant with its power, that it unfolds itself necessarily, can it be said that nature is imminently eternal. For this reason, Schelling's position is untenable for Novalis, despite Schelling's supposed embrace of Spinozan ontology. In general dualism of forces in nature, if general dualism of forces in nature implies the injection of negativity, I would like to suggest that Novalis's notion of the originary infinitism of nature manifests itself in the conception of nature as the imminent eternal power of self-actualization constrained by none. Hendrik Steffens, a proponent of Schelling's thought, provides an exemplary account of Novalis's objection to Schelling. Steffen, uh, Steffens writes, Novalis does not want originary duplicity, but the originary infinitism of nature so little he understands the actual tendency of natural philosophy. Uh, indeed, infinitinomism is a consistent, consistent preoccupation of Novalis' thought, especially in his later writing. Instead of dualism of attributes in nature to which both Hegel and Schelling reduce Spinoza, the infinity of attributes. Well, reject, uh, rejecting Schelling's ontological dualism, Novalis equally opposes the Kantian metaphysical conception of matter and more precisely movement in matter. Novalis calls for the overturning the fundamental laws of mechanics and the theory of excitation. In this grandiose statement, Novalis responds to Kant's formulation of the second law of mechanics. Namely, all changes in matter have an external cause. Instead, Novalis formulates the following postulates, uh, number five. All motion and excitation only arise through motion and excitation. Stimulus and mobility are merely relations of motions. Everything that appears, for example, motion and excitation, was already previously there. As Novalis insists, movement does not owe its existence to external cause, but it is always already there. It pertains to nature. This position constitutes a major demarcation between uh, Spinoza's uh, um, and Descartes' understanding of nature, of course, since for Spinoza too, no first impulse is presupposed, but movement itself is an infinite mode of extension. All movement and individuation presupposes not a dualism of forces for Novalis, but a single craft or force power. And note that here in all these debates around uh, 1800, there is a certain ambiguity in the German Kraft, which can mean both force and power. And they will return to it um, shortly. Quote number six, Novalis. Everywhere a power or an action 
becomes temporarily visible and appears thoroughly diffused to manifest itself under certain emerging conditions, encounters, to become effective. All effects are nothing but the effects of one power. Novalis insists on one force power which manifests itself under the conditions that he also calls Berührungen, a central concept for Novalis which designates a productive or effective encounter that gives rise to the emergence of individuals or singularities. In this way, Novalis is aligned with Spinoza's thought for whom only one substance is possible, which unfolds its power in the plurality of powers of individuals, not a distribution of general forces, but distribution of singularities. This question lies at the heart of non commensurability of the Kantian real opposition and Spinoza's notion of kanatus, which Machere suggests is tendentially opposed to external causes. As Machere argues, Kantian position is irreconcilable with Spinoza because, quote, substance does not precede its most modes or lie behind their apparent reality as a metaphysical foundation or a rational condition. But in its absolute immanence, it is nothing other than the act of expressing itself immediately in all its modes. Here, two meanings of kraft, force and power, come to a head. Machere writes, the konatus, which are the expression of substance in its affections, are thus not forces. Kanatus is a determinate expression of a single power of nature, which is affirmation devoid of negativity. If one were to formulate the concept of the materialist dialectic uh, uh, around the concept of opposition, it cannot be centered on the notion of force, whether ontologically or metaphysically constituted. But neither can the materialist dialectic be founded on the level of singular essences, at least not in Machere's rendition. As Machere points out, that the Spinoza's theory, I'm quoting, nevertheless concedes a place for the notion of subject, which it defines as a relation no longer between essences, but between existences. And yet, having opened the possibility of the dialectic on the level of existence as opposed to essence, Machere is careful to insist that for Spinoza, there are not two orders of reality one substantial and infinite, and the other model or finite, but one single and same reality. On this point, I think, Machere exhibits some vacillation. On the one hand, his desire to open up a way for the materialist dialectic in Spinoza leads him to differentiate between levels of existence and essence. But on the other hand, his insight on the single order of Spinozan immanent ontology forecloses this possibility. The question of the dialectic hinges on the conception of power, the power of substance as it manifests itself in finite things on the one hand, and the power of kanatus to persist in existence on the other. hand. In order to untangle this vacillation, I will turn to Machere's discussion of determination of singular things in Spinoza, which enters into productive encounter with Novalis' notion of determination. As Machere points out, Spinoza's ethics offers two seemingly contradictory notions of determination as negative and affirmative. Um, the privileging of the negative determination in Spinoza in the Pantheismus Streit ultimately culminates in Hegel's famous summary of Spinoza's system uh, that all negation is determination, that all determination is negation. Machere, like uh, Mariana, like Warren, uh, explicates the Hegelian Hegelian forgery. Nevertheless, the ethics provides a veritable support to the claim that determination is negation in Spinoza. In the scholium to this proposition, Spinoza seems to equate finitude with negation. I quote, to be finite is in part a negation and to be infinite is the unqualified affirmation of the existence of some nature. That is an unqualified affirmation of some attribute of the substance. In other words, to be finite is a negation insofar as finite things are limited by other finite things of the same attribute. One must understand this statement in the context of Spinoza's definition of a mode as the affection of substance or that which is in something else and is conceived through something else. On the other hand, 
in his theory of Canatus, which is nothing but the actual essence of the thing, Spinoza indicates that individual is pure affirmation of its power to persist in being. Insisting on the contrast to the definition of the mode as in aleo, in something else, with respect to the theory of Canatus, Machere writes, quote, the notion of Canatus that refers directly to that of determination from which it removes all internal negativity. To the extent that a thing is determined as such in se est, through its imminent relation to substance, of which it is an affection, it opposes itself tendentially to all that limits its reality by threatening to destroy it. In this way, the negativity or tendential opposition is externalized to the level of existence as opposed to essence. Addressing the tension between essence as both tied to existence and to eternity is determination as in itself and through something else, affirmative and negative. Machere offer, offers the following way of reading this seeming contradiction in Spinoza. And I quote, this is from a uh, long quote from page 173. This is, a, and uh, Karina quoted this already. This is exactly the particular situation of singular things. They have their own essence, which is given within them and in which substance expresses itself certo e determinato modo. And they exist in exteriority, in an interminable sequence that links them to all other things. Their essence does not envelop their existence. It is that their existence and their essence are determined in completely different manners, through itself and through something. This is why the fact that singular things do not exist in eternity has no effect at all on the eternity of their essences. That is, their imminent tendency to preserve their being. Once again, Mashray's thought tends to separate two levels and Spinoza insisting to repeat that their existence and their essence are determined in completely different manners. And uh, Kirina talked about the perspectival approach to this. The reconciliation between the two determinations hinges on the insistence that the eternal essence of an individual consists in the manifestation of the eternal power of self-actualization of substance, and, <clears throat> and that it can only manifest this power in existence, though existence is not a uh, determinant of this power. While uh, one must insist that the two are strictly identical, the two modes of determination, it, is nonetheless, it nonetheless remains unclear in what way if at all, the power pertaining to eternal essence affects, limits, or determines the realization of power in existence, determined through external causes. Novalis likewise develops a theory of double determination of the individual, which shifts the meaning of Kraft from Kant's and Schelling's use of them as force toward the meaning of power. Novalis, as I will show, however, does not separate the two orders of determination. Instead, by theorizing their interrelation ex in existence, I will argue, Novalis produces a particular reading of Spinoza's Conatus, which Machere's interpretation enables, but in its symptomatic insistence on the separation of the levels of existence and essence, does not pursue. In this way, Novalis also points to a development of the materialist dialectic in Spinozan key. Novalis conceives a body as a combination of figure and degree. Quantity or figure is an effect of being in the world and interaction with it. Degree or energy designates a certain intensity or power that corresponds to the body's capacity to persist in its being in spite of external stimuli. The power is a token of the body's complexity and its capability. The more power the body possesses, I'm quoting, the more capable it is, and the greater is its degree. In turn, the particular power of the individual and its singular capacity or tendency to absorb external stimuli is manifestation of a power of nature. Alle Kraft gehört zu der Kraft. Uh, all power belongs to world power. This singular manifestation of power, which is an expression of world power, is the function of berührung or a singular encounter between individuals. Berührung or encounter gives occasion to the systematization and unification 
of what will be the singular relation between figure and degree again quantity and quality the intensive and the uh, uh, extensive determination here I argue for rendering Kraft as power and Weltkraft as world power rather than world force for the following reason. The discussion about forces and elementary forces are typical around 1800 among Novalis' interlocutors. However, force, as I read it in Schelling and others, is generally associated with a particular quality that inhibits or forms an individual. So gravity is such a force. Power and powers, on the other hand, as I read in Novalis and Spinoza, are homogeneous in quality and unfolded in time. That this power is realized in different quantities or at different instances. For this reason, Spinoza's conatus as actual essence of an individual designates a singular realization of power of one substance in a determinate way. Novalis's use of craft is not always consistent, but insofar as in his discussions of bodies, he associates, associates it with capacity, vermögen, and quantity. Body has more or less power rather than more or fewer forces. It comes close, closer to Spinoza's understanding of power than to Schelling's force, of which there are only two. What is interesting for our purposes is that Novalis correlates the determination of the individual through power, often uh, um, correlated with interiority, and that through the external causes. The more, the more power and capacity a body has, the higher is its degree. That is, the higher is degree of determination through external causes. Novalis writes, the more diversely individualized something is, the more diverse its encounter with other individuals, the more variable its boundaries and neighborhood. The more complex the individuation, the greater capacity the body has for encounters with other individuals. This is consonant with Spinoza's position on the complexity of the individuals, of course. But Novalis adds another element to this dynamic. Novalis insists on relative variability of the intensive determination itself. The capacity to live is determined through certain limits of the variations of power, the intensive capacity to undergo external encounters. And this is quote number seven. Death is nothing but an interruption in the exchange between the inner and outer stimuli. This function has a maximum and a minimum with the exchange ceasing if this is reached. So to return to the previous passage, this means that the higher the degree of individualization, the more diverse the milieu of the individual. So the limits of the individual are capable of greater modification without perishing. Novalis's transindividual thinking, which he shares with uh, Spinoza, is the condition for this position. As Novalis writes, um, das echte individuum is auch das echte individuum, the individual is uh, the real individual. Like in Spinoza, the individual in Novalis consists of other individuals and belongs to higher orders in of integration of transindividual reality, to borrow uh, Balibar's terminology. Well, critiquing Gottlob Werner's classification of minerals, Novalis reproaches him for the assumption of stable individuals to classify, insinuating thereby Werner's Unkenntnis der Übergangsnatur im Wesen, that is, the lack of knowledge of transition, both in being and essence. Transition in essence concerns the process of individuation. For Novalis, it is the question of effectivity of encounter. For all effectivity is transition. And the issue of transition of being or essence concerns his theory of encounter. In turn, the interiority of an individual is already relational. So individual is then conceptualized as a kind of feedback loop of relational determination between determinations between interior and exterior intensive and extensive determinations. So this relative interiority of the individual is perhaps best described by the term extimacy proposed by Jacques Lacan to designate 
intimate exteriority. In turn, this dynamic in Novalis, I propose to call extimate determination. Extimate determination is a process of individuation that would account for what Novalis calls the inner plurality of S. One of Novalis's fragments contains the following programmatic note about life and thought in mass, collectively. Collectivity. Pluralism is our most inner essence or being. One finds an attempt to develop this theory in Novalis's discussion of the human nucleus. And this is a long, longer quote, uh, number eight. Novalis writes, the nucleus of a human being is a foundational form as it were, which by means of a number of factors common to all people becomes transformed into a divergent secondary forms, defective births, or literally monstrosity, mis misgeburt, which then alters the similar form of the innumerable members, producing both the difference in their configurations and their motions, and finally, even the imperfection in a large number of the members. This imperfection in every raw system must be gradually evened out through the life of the system. This produces a new, general, similar fundamental form, uh, foundational form, and motion that consists in an infinite number of dissimilarities, and which also contains the synthesis of the original simple fundamental form and motion and their countless possible alterations or variations. So that is to say, the nucleus as a foundational form, as a result of the relation to the milieu, undergoes a transition and thus becomes a divergent secondary form, a monstrosity. In the teleonomic development of the human as a raw and incomplete system, the problems of the imperfect composition are processually resolved to produce a new general similar foundational form. That is, the teleonomic development of the human individual is animated by a series of contingencies that modifies within certain limits of the species, insofar as an allgemeine ähnliche Grundgestalt is produced. So it modifies the original nucleus. In other words, the nucleus of the individual is extimately determined as a result of a series of encounters witnessed to its numerous alterations and variations. It consists of incorporations of exteriority into the essence of the individual. At another occasion, commenting on the process of individuation of characters in poetics that should mimic the very natural process of individuation, while writing on the role of contingency, Novalis echoes the latter insight. I quote, each nucleus is a dissonance, a misunderstanding that should be eventually evened out. The first moment grasps, grasps the mutually constitutive parts in a relation that cannot remain a, as is. The original interiority thus is not only a relation, but also an incongruity or misrelation, misverhältnis. That is, the emergence of the individual consists in a conflict, a dissonance, the resolution of which is none other than the becoming of the individual. In the case of human individuation, this process finds its depiction in the gen uh, genre of the novel in Bildungsroman, of course, of which the exemplary case is Goethe's Wilhelm Meister. Novalis's interpretation of this novel, re novel revolves around the theory of nucleus as a dissonant misrelation. The protagonist is led through his singular fate in a series of attempts to resolve the dissonance of his originary nucleus, the necessity of both bourgeois life and aesthetic highs, ultimately to see said originally nucleus modified through a productive encounter with Natalie. Only in the raw system that is actually existing individual, unlike in the novel, which is a being of reason, uh, the dissonance is never fully removed, but displaced onto a new form. In this sense, the individual for Navalis is an event of individuation that comes about as a result of contingency that constitutes a singular layering of external causes as the modification of its originally dissonant interiority. It is the dynamic of the estimate determination that opens way to thinking the materialist dialectic in Spinoza. Um, 
However, so this is obvious. One must question whether Novalis's notion of dissonant nucleus reverts or anticipates Hegel's injection of negativity in the conception of contradiction in essence. That is, whether it diverges from Spinoza's fundamental thesis that, quote, things are of contrary nature, that is, cannot be in the same subject, and so far as one can destroy the other. And whether, in the words of Machere, this dialectic, quote, does not presuppose its complete completion in its initial conditions. Or whether, on the, on the contrary, Navalis's theory of estimate determination is an elaboration on Spinoza's thesis that, quote, if two contrary actions are around in the same subject, a change will have to occur either in both of them or in one only until they cease to be contrary. I think the originary dissonance as the very manifestation of Canatus is not only thinkable in Spinoza's framework, but it is necessary, given the individual's participation in transindividual reality. Spinoza gestures towards this position in his famous correspondence with Oldenburg on the question of the relation between parts and the whole. In his response, Spinoza, instead of addressing how each part of nature agrees with its whole, as Oldenburg requests, Spinoza insists on speaking about how each part coheres with the others while pleading ignorance on how each part agrees with the whole of nature. Instead of addressing the question about the whole of nature, Spinoza shifts the concept of the whole onto the model level, that is, on the level of determination of individuals as follows. And this is the quote number nine. And I'm finished. By the coherence of parts, then, I understand nothing but that the laws or the nature of the one part attempts, adapts itself to the laws or the nature of the other part so that they are opposed to each other as little as possible. Concerning whole and parts, I consider things as parts of some whole to the extent that the nature of the one adapts itself to that of the other so that they all agree with one another as far as possible. But insofar as they disagree with one another, to that extent, each forms in our mind an idea distinct from the others, and therefore it is considered as a whole and not as a part. So to the extent that two bodies disagree with one another, they comprise separate wholes or individuals. To the extent that they cohere with one another, they together comprise a whole. So if we continue thinking with Balibar's notion of transindividual, we must admit that coherence rather than agreement is the perpetual reality of actually existing canatus. That is, one cannot say that the parts comprising individuals entirely agree with one another. Rather, they cohere, in original Latin coherere, meaning to stick or cleave together, which means, according to Spinoza, that the parts are opposed to each other as little as possible, but still opposed. The individual consists of parts in tension. It persists to the extent that those parts that disagree with each other nonetheless do not destroy each other, at least provisionally. So in conclusion, the idea of extima determination as a materialist dialectic in Novalis opens up the following hypothesis. For Spinoza, this would mean that conatus, considered as an actual essence of the individual, is relatively variable, and to that extent, the limits of the canatus, what constitutes its perishing or persistence as being, is variable according to the external causes or the encounters that the body undergoes in the process of its becoming. That is, this hypothesis would imply that conatus also entails a singular concatenation of external relations given in the event of individuation, and that concatenation sets the limits of the variation of essence through the incorporation of external relations. This would mean that the affirmation of the canatus is inextricable from the existence of the individual, that what could not conceive, to quote Machere again, the individual's existence and their essence as determined in completely different manners. Canatus, as an actual essence of the thing, cannot be anything but a relational determination of its effectivity also through its external causes. For this reason, Marfino concludes that, quote, the essence of things can therefore in no way logically precede the relations and connections in existence. As Marfino continues, quote, the essence of things is now the fait accompli of relations and circumstances that have produced and continue to reproduce this existence. 
It is now conceived only starting from its power to act, its potential for action, which alone reveals its true interiority. The reading of Novalis through Spinoza would further add that thinking the materialist dialectic along the lines of extimate determination would not only entail the concept of tendential opposition of Canatus, as Machere puts it, but it would also imply that the Canatus consists in the capacity for incorporation of external relations in encounters, and not only in tendential oppositions, as a modification of the power to persist in being, within certain limits, of course. In the materialist dialectic, then, Canatus would designate the limits of the capacity of acquiring or shedding layers of external relations as a concatenation of the singular essence. Think of the Spanish poet. The eternity of essence does not only designate then the, determin the determinate power of substance alone, but the determinate limits of its variability. To persist in being does not mean to persist in self-identity. The dialectic in this case would mean the process of individuals becoming other than self without losing the limits of its dynamic form. But not through contradiction given in essence, but in tendential opposition and encounter and their incorporation in the power to act. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, let's uh, take five minutes, uh, have a refreshment, and come back for uh, some some more conversation. Uh, please, anybody, uh, feel free to write a, um, a question or comment in the chat, and uh, we'll be back in five minutes. Great. Okay. Um okay. Um let's uh let's begin. Um uh, Warren, there's a question from Davide uh, Galashvili. Galish, huh? I can read it, um, but uh you, you might it's it's a little bit longer, so you can read it yourself if it helps. Um uh, one of the main arguments of the Hegelians against Spinoza is that the replacement of the subject standpoint with a substance standpoint makes the historical process and the development of history incomprehensible. According to this argument, if there is not any subject with free will or predetermined teleology, then what should be the locomotive of history? In response to this criticism, can we talk through Spinoza about the concept of historical development and what is the driving force of historical course according to a Spinozistic standpoint? <clears throat> um, okay, is that, the, is that it? Yeah, that, that's the question. Okay, hold on one second. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that we have to do is um, think about the history of the concept of subject. And I, it's too bad that Etienne has left, but if you, if you look at his essay, Citizen Subject, and, the, and you think about the concept of subject, it was only fairly recently that the idea of subject as agent, as actor came into existence. 
And uh, I would say um, one of the most interesting things is that in the initial use of the term subject, it was connected to a term that uh, Joseph used at the beginning, imputation. That is, it, and we see this in Kant as well, um, a bit later. Uh, that is the, the uh, position of being the agent of an action was considered to be something that had to be imputed to an individual, that is uh, attributed to an individual, which suggests that it's not observable, it's not uh, materially evident, it's something that for legal purposes, both Locke and Kant uh, say this, has to be uh, attributed to the individual in order for individuals to be held accountable for their acts, okay. Now, the, the other thing about um, uh, the idea of a subject in the sense that you're talking about is that it is, it's absolutely linked to teleology. That is because subject in being a subject must act through will for a, to obtain a particular purpose. And this is typically, it's not the, by any means the only idea of God but it's, it's one of the ideas of God. And, uh, you know, to, to say it in a certain way, it's not the most philosophically rich idea of God either. It's a project, Spinoza regarded it as a projection of the legal subject, uh, I'm going to put that term in there, uh, onto God, the idea of God. Okay. So the, the term subject is already in and of itself a, a problem. And I think that uh, the, the notion that we somehow need teleology, I think is, is an extremely questionable notion that uh, assume, I mean, because it seems like it's human freedom, but teleology is not human freedom. And you end up with something like um, the market according to Adam Smith, because he believes individuals basically direct themselves according to their desires by their will. And they end up often in uh, a system which is going to uh, be to their detriment. And it, that's uh, just the way it goes because that's the only uh, rational organization according to him. And teleology is, you know, has, as many, many people have noted, it's, it's an apologetic system that says things must be this way. And it, people are addressed as subjects uh, in the sense that you've already chosen it to be this way. That is, your actions betray a consent, to use that term, a choice that you've already made, even if you don't know it or, or aren't aware of it. And, and, and you end up uh, being positioned as someone who's consented to an order that you didn't even know existed, and then you are assigned accountability for that order. And, you know, it's like you've made it, you've entered into a contract and that's that. And these ideas are not foreign to the idea of God. They're completely compatible with the idea of God. And for Spinoza, they have everything to do with the origin of the idea of God. And I think what, we're not talking about, you know, like the Hegelian view of substance, something like that, that is emanation or something. Okay, uh, when, I mean, Spinoza, you, I don't want to make a, such a huge leap, but when we're talking about social historical reality, we're talking about, I mean, you could say um, something like, you know, as Althusser said, class struggle is the motor of history. That doesn't mean that there's a subject directing uh, history. It means that the direction of history is determined by, as the outcome of struggles between various groupings. And there's no subject there. I mean, you could say uh, the individual uh, groupings or something, but it's not there. I don't think the subject as a category, I mean, it's, it's inescapable because it's imposed on us, but I don't think it's a, it, in any way it can serve us as a, a legitimate uh, way of analyzing historical reality. It's, it leads us back to the law, to the legal subject, to the autonomous subject, all these things that we have to get away from in order to make reality intelligible. So that's my short answer. Great, thank you. Um...
Um, Sergei, I don't know if you've read um, um, Cesare's uh, comment, but I'll read it aloud. Um, uh, this is for Sergei. Um, I found your notion of extement determination to be very compelling. Likewise, I very much um, like the way that you discuss uh, the concept of Conatus. My question is, if I have understood you correctly, according to your discussion of Conatus, there cannot be any determination of Conatus that is not extement, or am I misunderstanding you? Um, could you uh, respond? Uh, so, uh, if you think about uh, uh, part two, proposition uh, 13, lemma seven, right, where um, Spinoza talks about different levels of integration of bodies, and then he concludes it by this uh, uh, famously misinterpreted statement uh, that uh, um, <clears throat> nature comprises a whole with infinite variability. And in previous lemmas, he posits that there are kind of minimal bodies. So Mashere shows that both are uh, um, beings of reasons, and they're limit cases. And those are the limit cases where the canatus would not be extremely determined. If there is infinite variability in something like model level, that wouldn't be estimately determined. But again, this is a limit case. It is uh, uh, being of reason. Otherwise, yes, it seems to me that the conclusion would be that uh, estimate determination pertains to all canatus, and it depends, of course, on the complexity of the individual. The more encounters it can undergo, the more the greater the variability of the estimate determination, whereas the very simple bodies uh, may have very limited. So for example, uh, like something like uh, the state uh, is considered as an individual is um, um, much less, it is not the same as organism, but it, it is composed in a less uh, perfect manner in the sense that the coherence of part is less uh, coherent than in organism. And there, perhaps the estimate determination is, is has a much greater var variability. So if we to go back to a little bit to the previous question, that there we can think of certain historical developments also as the development of the estimate determination. But it seems to me, if we take this hypothesis seriously, Cesare, I, I, th I think that would be my answer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Warren, uh, there's a question from uh, uh, David McInerney. McInerney uh, I know that guy, yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you've read uh, his comment, but- uh, 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 No, I didn't see that. Okay, I'll, I'll read it. Um, uh, the comment is that I thought while listening to the first part of your presentation, how each of the other political philosophers that Althusser returned to in his lectures on the history of political philosophy, Montesquieu, Rousseau, and Machiavelli, each have this void that is at the center of their work, and which Althusser brought to the fore. Machiavelli, the political void of the new prince in a new principality, Rousseau, the void of the undifferentiated plenitude of the savages of the forest, and Montesquieu, the void of the desert without laws presided over by the oriental despot. It seems that Hegel uses Spinoza as his constitutive void, as a pre-philosophical oriental theoretical nothing that operates as an other and stands in for pre-philosophical thought in a quasi-platonic maneuver. I'm wondering if you have any more to say on these voids, specifically in relation to what Machere posits in Spinoza. Yeah, that, I, I think it's a very interesting, uh, extremely interesting comment. And, and I, you know, uh, Machere is very interested in, he's not the only one, but he's very interested in uh, Hegel's repeated reference to substance as an abyss, because, and that's, that's the term that he uses. And uh, what, what does that mean? And I, and I think you, you I, I can't go into all the other figures, but I think um, for Hegel, the, the very need to you know to go into great he goes into great detail in the in the the introduction to the lectures on the history of philosophy to uh, sort of examine and bring out the the characteristics of what he regards as non philosophy that is masqueraded as philosophy and he has a, a, he's very determined to reduce it to nothing. And, or reduce it to triviality. He says, uh, you know, the the uh, philosophies of the East, which which includes, you know, everything outside of Europe for him, um, 
uh, are like, they're the objects of fascination, like a Chinese jar vase or something. I mean, it's that kind of thing. And, and I think the need to, um, to create a void, I think that's what he's doing. He's making a void where there obviously isn't one in order to situate his own philosophy as what he in a symptomatic way says is impossible an absolute beginning with, you know, beginning with being. And it's in a way you can connect that to the fact that in the logic, uh, in the section, very, at the very beginning, where, with what must science begin, something like that. Uh, being is immediately nothing, nothingness. And, and I think there's, there's a connection there. He has, to, he has to carve out a space, a void or an abyss or an empty space and, and to make his, his conception of philosophy the conception. But in doing so, he leaves traces of his uh, actions, which he does throughout. And, and the interesting thing about Spinoza, Spinoza doesn't correspond to the, the chronological scheme that Hegel's laid out. And chronology is very important to him. Things move in a linear way and they can't be otherwise. And that's why I think Spinoza is particularly burdensome. He's not, despite what he says, he's not reducible to, you know, whatever the, his fantasy is, bad infinity or something. And I think um, he, he's clearly um, threatening to Hegel in certain ways. And there are symptoms of that all over, as, as uh, Mashray points out. And the, the way he insists on, on seeing a substance as an abyss is one example of that. And so I'm not, I'm not really connecting it to the other people you mentioned and what you say is right about them. But I think there's a specificity here for Hegel and Spinoza that uh, is, a, is different. I mean, it doesn't mean it's not related, but okay, that's that. Okay, um, I have a question actually, um, Warren. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking about, um, you know, you've written other people as well about um, the strategy of lieutenancy in Althusser's um, discourse. In mm -hmm. one uh, uh, anthropological character mask standing in for another. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the effects that are basically uh, created by this mm -hmm. uh, in Althusser's discourse. You know, I had this feeling while reading Mashray's book that the the strategy of lieutenancy is is been significantly modified when both come out onto the stage. You know, we have now the alternative. You know, and that they're both there. And I just wanted to ask, you know, if you've thought about that, and if you, I mean, not like kind of in an intellectual history way of sort of like why did Mashray do this, or you know, is it in some way in response to that, but more like if the effect or like how the effects are changed by like uh, if there's sort of something that Althusser did and does with lieutenancy that we don't necessarily get in this particular text and if that I don't know if that like uh, if there are yeah if there's anything that kind of um uh emerges uh, for you for uh from that I I mean I just had a particular uh response to it you know which it felt you know, in some way, you know, to put it just sort of a little bit polemically, you know, that there's sort of a, a partisan nature to the text, or it's a, a sectarian to even put it more, you know, sort of strongly and that that lieutenancy and the Althusser strategy of lieutenancy kind of, kind of takes away that possibility in a certain way, or kind of distorts that already from the beginning, because <laughs> that what you're looking at is, is actually, you yeah. know, sort of there's a slumber, you're looking at sort of something slumbering, and that Anyways, that was some, you know, something that I, I responded to in this text, and I just was wondering if you kind of thought about that or how that would make you think about the kind of lieutenancy or the strategy of lieutenancy in Althusserian thinking in a more general way. Well, I think the first thing you have to uh, keep in mind that there are, let's say, two sources of this. Uh, one is Lenin in, in uh, materialism and imperial criticism uh, at the very beginning of the text, close to the beginning. And um, there he, he calls it relative truth. And he says there are certain, uh, we call them truth, certain theories or something that are uh, precise enough 
to allow things to advance in some way, even if slowly, okay, but not so precise that they, they, they resolve into a dogma that becomes an obstacle, okay? And, you know, I think in many, many ways, I mean, you're absolutely right. Althusser is obsessed with this idea because it's something that is very seldom acknowledged, which is the historicity of a science. And you know, the, the ability to say, we don't know X yet is extremely rare. And this is something Althusser and, and Spinoza, to, I mean, this is what I was trying to say with Spinoza. He is willing to say, I mean, it, it, the text that I think is very interesting on this is, it's, it's otherwise a very bad text, but the, uh, doc, the discovery of Dr. Freud, Dr. Freud's discovery, it was written in 1976, it was never, presented and published ultimately without his permission. But he says of Lacan, you know, and he says uh, Lacan is a brilliant man. There are many interesting things about his work, but he, at some point, he decided to constitute a science at a moment that no such science was possible. And, and there was a kind of imaginary leap that uh, in some way is the absence of the kind of prudence that he was, uh, that he valued. And I think that's a very important point. And I think Spinoza is someone who thinks in a very similar way. That's why he's not, it's not a, some ploy or not only a ploy when he says, you know, uh, I, that's enough about this. And it's not that he doesn't want, people try to impute all kinds of motives to him, you know, he's, he's afraid of persecution or something. I think it's really, it's a way of saying, I don't, we, we, or we don't understand. We don't, we can't really explain this. We are at uh, an impasse. Like if you think of the Tractatus Politicus, the, the, the question of the multitude who makes up the multitude, he, he got himself into a, a kind of a contradictory state. So I, I think it's, it's a recognition of the historicity of these things, that, that's Lenin, okay who does it, puts it in a fairly crude way, but it's also Bachelard. I mean, Bachelard in his analysis of uh, epistemological obstacles, et cetera. I mean, he talks about the, the, the necessity of inventing concepts that will not become obstacles, even though we know they are not completely adequate. And this is, I mean, this is why he's constantly talking about, you know, we, we have to, we have to guard against our own tendencies to grab onto something as, a, as an adequate theory when it's clearly not. And the, you know, the history of, uh, of science is littered with these things uh, and he has long lists of them. And it's very interesting. And, and, and I think that's where um, it's coming from. Now, in, in the case of Hegel or Spinoza, I think Mashre is, um, you know, he's fairly, I mean, it, it's very, very uh, interesting and he does a, an incredible job in sort of explaining things in Spinoza that people haven't explained. Uh, that's absolutely right. Uh, and, you know, because he's coming from a kind of Marxist point of view, et cetera. Uh, but I think he too, I mean, you know, he's very cautious. I mean, it may, it may not seem so, but it is so. I mean, if you, if you look at his book on literature, for example, he doesn't say, you know, the, the English title, A Theory of Literary Production, as he said many times, suggests that he's, he's invented a new theory. And he says, I have not invented a new theory. All I did was I enumerated, you know, these, these obstacles, he called them illusions. And at the end of the first long section of his book, he says, now we can talk about a theory. That's it. So I, I think there's a there's a, a respect for you know the historicity, the temporality of discovery, and uh, but also an awareness that you can't just put anything in the place of the concept. And the the danger is not just that it won't work at all. The danger is that it may work a little bit, but but will ultimately become a barrier to a more adequate concept and may mislead people in various ways. So, you know, that I, I see Mashre as that, like saying, okay, you know, we can, it, it's a kind of turning point because he, it's not just uh, he's saying something about, about Spinoza, he's also opening up Hegel. I, I believe that that's important. And his attitude towards Hegel changed after this and he became much more receptive and 
He wasn't against using the idea of contradiction, which he had opposed from early on. Uh, and, I, and I think that's, it's important not to kind of, you know, overestimate. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very valuable book, but we, we don't want to attribute more to it than, than he's trying to do is what I would say. Thank you. Um, if other people have um, questions or comments, please um, please uh, bring them forward. So I, I just have uh, one further comment to Cesare. And uh, uh, perhaps, uh, Cesare, the concept of estimate determination is uh, easier grasped on the level of ideas. Uh, the ideas are also individuals. And what you're doing with your book with Fanon and Spinoza, you don't know how the limits of Spinoza will be expanded as a result of this, right? Uh, you don't know in advance, but it is uh, it corresponds to Machere's discussion of uh, knowledge as uh, uh, knowledge as production rather than representation. And uh, so, if we think about it this way, and Machere's own uh, project where something new is opened up when Spinoza and Hegel read like this, right? So, how do we account for this phenomenon? Right? How do we account uh, for the canatus of Spinoza itself? So Spinoza corpus itself. Great, thanks. I think uh, Joseph has a question or something you want to say. Okay, um, I had a, just a question for Sierra Hey, because I, I was struck by um, something you, you mentioned in passing um, about, I, I'm not sure if it was Novalis's reading of uh, the Buildings Roman or, or sort of comments or in relationship to it. I think you mentioned uh, Wilhelm Meister. Um, but I was, I was wondering if you were sort of suggesting that there's this sort of the building, there's like a sort of trans individual reading or something of Bildung's Roman, which I, which I think is uh, kind of a fascinating uh, proposal. Um, but it, it just reminded me that uh, Belly Bar in um, Citizen Subject, and I think it's the, the introduction, he has a, um, he refers in passing to phenomenology of spirit as one of the great uh, Bildung's Roman. Mm -hmm. It is uh, interesting, uh, Joseph, uh, your comment. Uh, indeed, uh, so you're, sorry, 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 you're muted. Uh, I shouldn't be muted. Uh, how about now? Yeah. Uh, so it is an interesting uh, comment because Bildungsroman has been, uh, 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 phenomenology has been received as Bildungsroman. Um, mm -hmm. And what I want to say with Novalis, what is productive, indeed, it is some kind of trans-individual reading of Bildungsroman. But unlike an individual's actual existing individual, the work of the novel, which has beginning and end, is teleological. Because it is not, he calls it not a raw system, but he has some class, bunch of classifications of different systems. And there, there is only one contingency that unfolds itself to the end. And there, actually, this is where we come very close to the idea of negation of the negation as the movement of positivity, right? If the finitude of determinations is assured, then there is teleology. And that is the case of the Bildungsroman. Of course, he, again, he, he still reads it as a dissonant nucleus and uh, a resolution with this nucleus, but it is uh, a teleological in nature. This is why we have to differentiate like Machere does between beings of reason and the actually existing canatus. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, um, 
if anybody has anything else to say, please, please do. But if not, then we'll uh, <clears throat> let ourselves uh, finish. Okay, well, I just want to thank everybody, um, the speakers uh, in particular, the participants, everybody for being here. This was a great day. A lot to think about now, um, but I uh, really appreciate everybody being here. So thank you all. Um, we, we, have, uh, we did a recording, so we can send the recording to everybody who's here. So uh, if you'd like to see that. So uh, yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, enjoy the rest of your day, your evening, your morning, whatever time it is for you. <laughs>